But yeah, yeah, two people have some emotions. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, we're going to identify smart objectives, write smart objectives, discuss discuss elements of a lesson plan, uh, discuss how lesson planning promotes active learning, and write we're going to write lesson plan. And we're going to discuss how Bloom's <laughs> taxonomy affects lesson planning and curriculum mapping. So we're going to talk a little bit about curriculum mapping and then too. Okay. So here's the first thing we're going to talk about lesson plans that really enraging, uh, not just in Saudi Arabia, but just anywhere when you go in a classroom and teachers don't have a lesson plan. I know you're a leader. One of the things I hope that you do in your school is really enforce this idea that teachers have lesson plans every day. You cannot walk into a classroom program. Okay? You just, it's unprofessional. It's, it's, you're not doing your job. You have to, you have to think about what you're going to do and write it down. Okay? And hopefully you write it down a couple of days in advance. So each school have a, has a different policy. Two weeks in advance. Yeah. I, I don't know about two weeks. We love the weekly plan. I don't know about two weeks. Yeah, you cannot. Let me, you tell, cannot. You about, let me tell you what you know my what? thoughts are. No, I don't. Plan no, I don't. Yes. Like you can give them after the lesson. Let, let, me, tell you what my, let me tell you what my thoughts are about how far in advance you should write lesson plans. Lesson plans are kind of like living documents in that they really should flow with what happened the, the, pre, the prior lesson, so, or the prior couple of lessons. So you want to be kind of careful about writing them too far in advance because they're really, they really are living documents and they should really fit the life and they should be very, the life and the activities and the actions and the history of what's going on in your current class. Now, the advantage of being an experienced teacher and teaching the same course over and over again is that you have already written lesson plans for previous years. So it's okay to use those prior year lesson plans. However, now you need to be the reflective teacher in that you're looking at what you did last year and you might need to make some adjustments and tweaks. Okay? Because each class is different. Every class is going to have a, a different learning curve and different experiences. And what we're going to talk about because next week in every class is going to have different learner profiles. Okay. So, so although it is having sense when your principal says you're going to teach the same thing that you taught last year, every teacher goes yes because you have all <laughs> that. You have all those that root those resources. You have those experiences. You have the lesson plans. And you now you have a better grasp. I say, I say that's what makes you a really good teacher is when you when you learn the content for a certain grade level and you just stay in that zone because that means you get better and better each year because you become more and more confident with the content. You become very confident with the content. Okay, and so you find that your teaching becomes more and more dynamic. I find that at the university, you know, the first, the first uh, semester I might teach a course, let's say I'm teaching advanced writing, okay, I'm kind of feeling it through, feeling what I need in the course. So to be honest with you, those students, can somebody close those, those doors for me? So those students who, this is an echo in this room, those students who, uh, have me that first year that I'm teaching a certain course, okay? Even though I think they're getting good in quality instruction in that I'm trying my best, they're not going to get this, the same quality as if when I took the course in five years. Because in five years, I know exactly where I want to be. I know where students get hung up. I can, I can uh, predict certain questions. I can predict certain challenges. It's just so dynamic. I mean, teach a course over and over again. This is why I really want, I really like when teachers stay at one school. Right? You stay in one school. Yeah. You know, obviously don't stay anywhere where you're not being treated. And we know the challenges here. 
that we have here. But if you can if you can find a good place to work, stay, stay there, there because it is it, actually a part of your professional development. One of the things that I see here is that people want kind of this microwave like training. Okay, Mr. Ray, show me how to do this. Or Mr. Ray, do you know a workshop? Okay, there's no workshop that is magical that's gonna make you the best teacher overnight. Okay, it's through your experience. Okay, it's through testing. So you go to the workshops, you go to the trainings to, to test. It's the same thing we do with our students. Okay, we give them practice to test, to test things. And then practice, 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 practice. That's what our instruction is about. And we're going to talk about it today when we talk about active learning. Okay? That's what we're really about. So that's why we need to move away from lecturing, reduce teacher talk. Right? That's why we need to reduce teacher talk. Because. But when you, when you are handling two, three grades together, Lesson planning is a big task. It becomes a huge big task. task. It becomes a huge task yeah. when you teach a multiple yes. uh, content. Con con it becomes a subject. <laughs> it becomes a tremendous task. Yes. And it, it, in my opinion, if, in my opinion, I would not set a, a, a teacher up. If anything, that if I ask anyone to do that, it's going to be my experience teachers. Teachers who, you know, they know the content. They, they can do it in their sleep. I would never ask a new teacher to do that, or a teacher new to my system to do to do that. Okay. But again, that goes back to what we talked about in day one: the golden rule, right? Be who has the goal makes the rules. So that's why, again, it's extremely important that you find a place that you enjoy working and you stay there. You know, and you build the team. You have the cultures of thinking that we talk about in the PA uh, discussions. Continue that culture of thinking. Okay, so uh, lesson planning becomes is critical to our jobs. Okay, and what we're going to talk about next week, which I, when I thought about, I thought about it today. And it, it's actually, teaching was a, a good example of what I'm just talking about because this is cohort five. This is the fifth year of training here in Saudi Arabia in teaching, and it just dawned on me today when I was driving here that. I should do learner profile before I do lesson planning. I'm actually, I actually, and it didn't dawn on me until today that I actually should talk about learning profiling first. If you look in your, your schedule, learning profiling comes after lesson planning. But when I thought about it, you should probably do learning profiling first. It's too, you know. So next cohort, I'm going to change that and do learning profiling first because knowing your students helps you do what? Write good lesson plans. Okay. In, in my opinion, you can't write a good lesson plan until you know those students. That's why I say the lesson plan is really a living document. It's a living document. Again, if you're that experienced teacher and you already have those lesson plans for the prior years, great, outstanding, but you still gotta tweak them. Uh, you still have to become the reflective teacher, right? and see what's going on in your class term. Okay. Um, so again, t is, a, is an example of, my experience this morning is an example of why we have to be reflective in our thoughts and, and, and really do it a while to figure out how it works. Because it's very strategic. Two, two classes. I, did two, I taught two classes here, mm -hmm. five A and five B. Okay. My lesson plans wouldn't always be the same. Like I would sometimes I have to make two lesson plans for these two teachers. So we're gonna talk about that, we're gonna uh, talk uh, about that. Yeah. We, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna because again we're trying to move towards you said, you said, best practices. Yeah, learner profile. Yeah, so learner profile. Learners are different. So what you what happens is you can have that same format in mind, but the, those two classes. Let's say you had uh, English five A, and then English with five B. You're going to find a personality in 5A is totally different from the person yes. personality in 5B. Okay. So the way you, the way you the give level. that instruction is totally different. So I, like, I, I'm, again, I'm experiencing that now in the university. Um, particularly, and I've been at the National Guard University, this is my fifth year now. And I, I, I noticed this year in particular, 
I teach uh, I teach a class called uh, vocabulary, and you see you might see it in some of my YouTube videos. Vocabulary uh, and reading, reading and vocabulary, English 103. And I have two two sections, and I notice with one section we do a lot of laughing and joking. In another section, the class is way more kind of because the students, the students don't want to laugh at you. And, and I mean, we tell them a couple, we laugh a couple, but they more want, you know, they want me to boom, 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 boom. Where the other class, they want me to come in and kind of relax, and you know, and it's totally. And both, when I do quizzes, they both get about the same uh, in the assessment. They do, they score both well. Uh, both sections score well. It's just they just have two different personalities. So uh, that's why it's very important that uh, if you watch that Coaches of Thinking video that I talked about on, on Tuesday and Wednesday, it was Tuesday and Wednesday, that you know you can't be the directive teacher. The teacher just giving directives. You got to have this mindset that you know you're really a belief teacher because if you're a belief teacher, you go to the students. You change your personality for the students versus the director teacher. <laughs> students, you 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 uh, you acquiesce to my personality. You change me. You modify me. No, we modify the students. Okay, we modify the students. You know, that, like I said, the first day, you know, that fake smile works. You know, even though you don't want to smile, that fake smile works. You know, because we have to adjust the students. So. Lesson plan becomes extremely critical to the business that we do, and that is delivering instruction. Okay? We cannot go into classrooms cold. You're asking for trouble. When you walk to a classroom and you didn't plan, and, you, and it's not written down, you're asking for trouble. I have this lesson that I did last week with you guys in the demo lesson, I've done that lesson about eight times with different cohorts, okay? Eight times. I know the lesson pretty well. But if you notice, what was I doing last week? I know the lesson, but I still, I still had to refer back to it. All right, let's see on that one, right? Because, it's, because you need that structure. Because you know you're a human being, and you may get lost in the moment, okay? And you only have a certain amount of time, so you need to make sure you're, you're very structured in how you deliver your instruction. Instruction, so it should be very well executed. So having that, having this there, allows you to kind of say, okay, I'm here. I want to. I don't want to do that right now. And all these things are going in your mind. I don't think I'm going to do that. Just because it's written down doesn't mean you have to do it. This is just to say, this is what I intend on doing, but life happens in the classroom. Things happen. You know, I've had classrooms where I stayed up all night because I thought this was going to be a dynamic lesson, and then something happens in the school, or something happens in the class, and I said, forget it, I'm not doing that, I'm doing something totally different today, because it's what I call situational teaching. Because the situation at that time calls for me to to forget this, I'll get this tomorrow, and deal with what's going on at the time, because that's most important, okay? That's why I am not a fan of pacing. I am not a fan of pacing. We, we set ourselves up for failure. Again, if you go into the lessons without properly lesson planning, you're setting yourself up for failure. Every, what I tell people, what I think I said it in the last video about classroom management is, if you're having classroom management problems, show me your lesson plan. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that 90%, 90% of the people who have classroom management problems is because they're not lesson planning. When if they are lesson planning, they're not lesson planning properly or they're using somebody else's lesson plan. <clears throat> Meaning they're using a lesson plan out of the book, out of uh, the school gave them a lesson plan. Okay? They haven't owned it for themselves. Therefore, the students, it's not personalized because you're not using any learning profile and you're not using anything about the students that's going to personalize the instruction and contextualize the instruction for them. 
So they're not going to be interested. Remember, we have this amygdala that says, what do I what's in it for, for me? me? Now, you, if you're doing a lesson plan that somebody wrote 10 years ago that your academic uh, director said here, and they wrote it 10 years ago for a school in India, and we are in Saudi Arabia, first of all, it's, it's not yours. You don't own it. You don't, you're not motivated because you didn't, you didn't sweat over it two days before. You're not compassionate about it. It's somebody else's work. So you just you're kind of mechanical about it. That same, that same emotion, the students feel it. It's, it, it. When you walk in that classroom, there's, a, there's chemicals going on. The students sense when you're happy. They sense when you're sad. They sense when you're excited. They sense when you're motivated. They sense when you're depressed. And whatever you come in, whatever energy you come in with, they're gonna they're gonna consume that energy and then react to you. Okay. Okay. See, if we don't believe me, if you look at animals, cats and dogs, our domesticated friends. They know when you're sad. They know when to leave you alone. You don't have to say anything. Right? If you want, if you if you ever own a dog, okay. Dogs can they? You don't have to say anything to a dog. Yeah. Because the, the words don't mean anything to a dog. Your emotions, the way you feel. Same thing with cats. Okay. If you go in, if you have it, if you have right. evil intentions for an animal, like, <laughs> that animal already sense it and run or fight you. <laughs> but if you're there with positivity, you know, you know, you're there with positive energy, then the animal will respond accordingly. It's the same thing with human beings. We know this in, in dating studies. When you do stay dating studies, it's not about how a person looks. Really, it's, it really isn't about that. No. It only becomes about that when there's no chemical connection. So when there's no chemical connection, then it becomes about money and looks and dress. But when there's a chemical connection, that person could be bald, fat, Ugly, short, <laughs> no money, broke, but you just love that person because there's a chemical thing going on. Okay? Yeah, that person could even look good to you, even yeah. though you're and, and, and everybody else is like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get that. I don't get that. But that's just how God made us. It is what it is. It is what it is, what it is right? And the same thing happens in your classroom. And the reality is, your students are your clients. Your learners are your clients, and they can sense when you're unprepared. And when they, when they they say, in their minds, subconsciously and even consciously, they're saying, "Oh, it's like what? This person coming in this class for unprepared? I'm gonna go and talk. I'm gonna play because they're not ready. Huh, they're not ready for like me. That. No, they're not ready for me. I want to go to the bathroom." I want to go to the bathroom. <laughs> And what they're really saying to you, what they're really saying to you is, you are not prepared. <laughs> you are paying, my, my mother and father are paying you a tuition. Yeah. And you're not prepared. <laughs> and then you go, you go to the principal, you go to, these, these Saudi kids are so disrespectful. Yes, they are. And, and I'm most sorry of the time, they are. And most of the time, it's you. Have, no, don't generalize. Most, most of the time, it's you. Sorry, I have a great sister, a girl who goes to college, she's a model. Mm -hmm. uh, this girl, uh, my, what we say, my assistant, mm -hmm. her name assistant, she always tells me, she's a very uh, impolite girl, she doesn't respect anyone. I just hugged this girl and told her, I respect you, you're a little lady, but please, you just listen to us. You should listen to us. And what is in you? Just to try to discuss it with me. Mm -hmm. This girl, whatever, I'm going near to her. Hi, teacher. I, 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 I miss you. And she's a grown up girl. She's like my daughter. So it's, it's what, about how connections. I deal with them. It's about connections. And, and for, when you have 25, 15, whatever number of students you have, you have in your classrooms, they're expecting you to be a professional. They can't communicate that because they're not mature enough. But they, that's what they expect. That's the expectation they have. Because you're a teacher. You're a teacher. They expect you to be professional. Just like they expect the doctor to save them. Right? They expect mommy and daddy to love them. It's about expectations. 
So one of the things that you can do that you can do to improve your classroom management is come into that classroom prepared. Prepared. Organized. People love organized people. People love people because what that communicates to them is they care about us. That this is a professional person who cares about us. Right? So the first thing I want to talk about when we talk about lesson planning is, is objectives. Okay? Objectives are extremely important to how we kind of look at what we want to do with students to help them. By then, the lesson that we may be able to do. To help them, to help them learn. Okay? So you got to start with the objectives. Okay? These are the these are the things that they're going to do in that classroom to help them get to a certain point. So you, you, can, you can have, in, in the lesson plan I just gave you, Dave calls them terminal objectives, okay? Uh, and then he calls them enabling object objectives. A lot of people, a lot of people have different terminologies. I call them my visionary objectives. And my vision, my visionary objectives, I probably won't see. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. They're not smart. My visionary objectives are not smart. These are things that I hope and aspire my students and I wish my students will be in the future. So I'm teaching these things because I want them to be the best person they can be. I want them to be good global citizens. These are things that I probably won't ever see. And then I have my, my instructional objectives. Okay? And my instructional, or what Dave calls your enabling objectives, which I think is a good terminology, it enables my terminal or my vision, visionary objectives. Okay? Right, so a lot of times, so the visionary objectives relate to your beliefs. Right? Referring back to that video in Ron Richard's chapter two, Creating Cultures of Thinking. Your beliefs, what beliefs do you have? And your beliefs are real, really centered around expectations. What, what do you expect of your students today, tomorrow, in 10 years, 20 years from now? Okay. Okay. So, what we do in our classrooms, really that thinking affects what we do in our classrooms. That thinking affects what we do in our classrooms. When you, when you have an expectation of beliefs, and when you have an expectation of directives, it becomes about getting to the content. It becomes about grades. All right, I want you to do this so you can do well on the test. I want you to do this so you can pass the class. I want you to do this so you can get your thesis certificate. Okay. So the way I approach TSU is that I care less whether you get the thesis certificate. And that's always been my position. Because I just want to make you a better teacher. So that's a belief thing for me. I don't have a direct point of view when it comes to TSU. I don't have, I'm assuming I have a, a belief point of view when it comes to TSU. I don't have a director point of view. A director point of view would be, okay guys, do these things in order to get your certificate. And I'm not, and I want a certain quality, but I want you to get through it. Okay. Whereas for me, it's about you going out delivering great instruction and being someone's champion. Okay. Now, the reason why I mention this is because this is very, very important to how you deliver instruction. Because that energy transfers over to what you actually write, those enabling objectives. Okay. Now those enabling objectives must be what? Smart. Smart. Does anyone know what SMART stands for? Right in black here. All, all your objectives must be smart. 
Any leader out there, any, any classroom leaders, any instructional leaders, what I want you to do this week, if you're an instructional leader, is do walkthroughs this week and see if your, your teachers are using SMART objectives. And I want you to come back and report to us. I want you to come back and report to us next week about what you found. Whether if you're an instructional leader, if you're an academic coordinator or something like that, I want you to do a walkthrough to meet your team and see if your team, uh, see if they're using smart objectives. Even if you're not a leader, if you have time to go into your colleagues' classrooms, see if they're using smart objectives. Maybe this may be a uh, professional op development opportunity, an informal professional development opportunity. All professional development opportunities do not have to be formal. Okay. So smart. Anyone? I had an SMB last week and the topic was <laughs> be smart. <laughs> Anyone? S. What does the S stand for? Because this is kind of the test. This is the litmus test on whether our lesson plans are create active learning. Whether our lesson plans create like active learning. So the S, anyone know? Specific. Don't you know this stuff you did yet, right? Specific. Specific. Measurable. So, so let's, do, let's do with the S first. Ah, no cheating. No, I didn't. <laughs> All right. Specific. This means, specific means that, if you notice my objectives here, that each action that you want them to take must be clear, concise, and cogent. It must be very simplistic of what you want them to do. Okay. Meaning, it's, it's an action that you want them to do. That is clear, concise, and cogent. It's not confusing. There's not a lot of moving parts on what you want them to do. You don't want them to do two things at one time. It's not vague. It's not ambiguous. What you want them to do is very conspicuous, very clear. Students will be able to identify smart objectives. Students will be able to write smart objectives. Students will be able to discuss elements of a lesson plan. Students will be able to discuss, write, very clear, very specific. There's no, huh? What do you mean by that? Huh? What? So, very important. This is when we, when we do micro teaching. We went over micro teaching. What do you do for exercise? All right, and we get to that point where you go, one, two, one, two, one. Two, one two, one. All the ones right here, all the twos right here. You're being what? Clear and specific. Okay? Which is very important as a, as a teacher, as an educator, it's extremely important. So that's what the S stands for. Specific. The N, I already heard it, is what? Measurable. This is the one that a lot of people tend to not understand very well. So not only should your objectives be specific, but they should be measured. They should be things that can be assessed. Things that, activities, actions that can be assessed. My position on this is, and this goes back to you, this is the reason why you want to teach it the same thing over and over and over again, because you might not be able to do this the first year because it's exhausting. But for every action, there's a rubric. If you can't create a rubric for it, it fails the smart test. If you can't create, if you ask the students to do something in the objectives, that kid, that a rubric 
cannot be created for, then it's, the objective is nothing. So objectives should be action words. Action words. Identify. Write. Discuss. Read. What else? Compare. Contrast. Underline. Circle, differentiate. These are all things that what? You can measure. These are all things you can create a rubric for. And again, in the, in the ideal situation, in, the, in teaching a class, of course, a subject over and over and over again, you can start to create rubrics for these actions that students can fall back on. This is why blended learning is so important. Because in blended learning, the student can click on the, and when they're doing it on a computer, they can click on something that's the root, so they can see, oh, okay, this is what success looks like, which is very important. So why, before I forget that thought, before I forget that leaders, leaders, also those who are not leaders, because they're gonna be future leaders, at, walk the classrooms and see how many teachers have their act objectives on the board or somewhere visible in the class for that day. Their objectives should always be visible. Why students need to know what success looks like. If you want to end your classroom management issues or problems, please close that door for me. If you want to end, if you want to end your classroom management problems, Make your vision clear. Make it plain. Let people know, let your learners know what success looks like. Because if they don't know what success looks like, they're going to get confused, and once they get confused, they're going to get disinterested. They're going to fight with you. They're going to run away from you. They're going to freeze on you. So tell them what success looks like. Because if, 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 it's, if it looks like there's no opportunity for success, you know, you're going to lose them. Again, this is why it's important to know your students. This is why I probably should teach you or talk about learning profile approach. Can we do that next week? We will. It's a part of this next week. Right? Next. This is so the reason why we have objectives of the board. In the states where I'm from, when I first started teaching, you didn't have your objectives on the board. Somebody didn't see those objectives. Ooh, ooh. That principal walk. Ooh. I, I just don't know. I, I have no clue. I have no idea. I just don't know. All right. Why? The student should be able to look at any point in time in that lesson and say, okay, this is what success looks like. These are things. We're, we're moving. We're progressing. I feel good about this. What's in it for me? Okay. All right. They know where they're going. They know what the finish line is. You ever get the student who goes, how much do I have to write? How many words do we have to write? How many, how many pages do we have to read? How many questions? What they're really asking is, what does success look like? That's what they're really asking. It's not because they're lazy. It's not because they're disinterested. They want to know what success looks like. And you want to know what success looks like, too. You want to know what you you don't want to be in your work not knowing whether you, the owner likes you, the principal likes you, whether you're being effective. You want to know what success looks like also. And not just in your professional life, but in your personal life. One of the reasons why we have relationship problems because we don't communicate with our loved ones what success looks like, what happiness looks like. We say, I want to be happy. You don't make me happy. But then you didn't tell the person 
what happiness is for you. So when they apply their ideals of happiness, you go, well, that's stupid. And then they go, that's not stupid. Why? Because that's happiness for them. And then you get a big argument because now you're insulting them. And now you got people sleeping on the couch. And it's just crazy. Because people don't communicate what success looks like. Well, you should know what they be at. Huh? That's, that's what I was crying last week. Okay. <laughs> you have to communicate. If you want to be successful in life, in your work, in your personal relationships, you have to communicate what success looks like. Again, chapter two, cultures of thinking, expectations. Tell people what you expect of them. As a consultant, that's what my job is. What are your expectations of me? Here's my expectations of you. This is what I expect. And if we can't come to that, then I, it's not a good place for me to consult. What do you want? Here's my beliefs, and here's what my vision is for you. Do we agree? If we agree, let's move forward. Here's what success looks like. That's my job. And that's what your job is as educators. You tell your clients, your students, and your parents what success looks like. The reason why your parents are in your business, in your teaching business, because you don't tell the parents what success looks like. So they do what? I'm going to tell you what success looks like because I paid, I paid, I paid the tuition. So now I'm going to, you didn't tell me, and now I'm going to tell you. And then, and then you go, the, the, the other parents, the parents, the only all, all the parents, they never protect us. Because you never tell anybody, no one's telling people what success looks like. Same thing with our kids. You don't communicate success to your students, to your own personal children, they're going to run them up. Because you didn't communicate what success looks like. Measure. It, it must yes, sorry. objectives remain on the board throughout the day. Throughout the day. Okay. So depending depending on how your classrooms are set up, what type of technology and the interesting thing now is we have smart it's boards. A smart board. it's a so you know, old school teaching we had a series of blackboards. Yes. All right. Yes. We had we had that section for it's objectives. Objectives, yes. And that data stayed there. Yes. Now, we have, now that we have smart boards, yeah. we lost space. Yeah. We lost, we lost uh, yeah. blackboard space. Yeah. So now it's very interesting how we do that. Yeah. So it depends on the technology in your classroom. Yeah. <clears throat> you have to think ahead. Yeah. You, you may have to, if you have a television. Laminated. <clears throat> no, no, yes. no, 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 so you have to figure out technology wise or uh, manipulative wise or maybe you go to Jarrell or something. I, 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 bought, I bought a small board like this, a whiteboard, and it was very small, I put it next to the board. Just right, just close to the board. Whatever works for you, post it. Make sure it's posted. Because I also make sure it's, we have the whiteboard here too, but I need that whiteboard as well, so I have to. So these are the things that you have to think about every, the first week of school. That actually before school starts, during the summer time, where I'm going to put, you know, the nerdy, be the nerdy teacher. Where am I going to put? You know, you should be hounding your uh, your principal. Where's my classroom? You know, in a perfect scenario, you pick you one class, you clean that classroom forever, right? Because you already know, this is my classroom, this is where I'm going to set things up. So every subject teacher puts her objectives. Every yeah, and it remains throughout the day. Throughout the day. Okay. No, when you go, you erase it. When you go, you erase it. Yeah, you erase it. Yeah. No, it's just oh, when yeah. you're in class. And you're here. Yeah. Okay. And then, because I'm moving from classes, in every class that I go, I'm sitting on the board. I'm sitting on the board. Yeah. So the traveling teacher, um, the traveling teacher, so if, what I would have is, if I was a traveling teacher, I would have sentence strips. Yes. Okay. It comes quite expensive, yeah. uh, but I would have uh, sentence strips, and then this. or they, they do have these ones where you can erase them. Laminated. Laminated when you, and they're magnetic. Yeah. So the traveling teacher, all right, 
Uh, but again, these are things that we have to think about when we're teaching. All right? So, objectives should be measurable. Okay? They should be action words. And the, the good thing about this idea of measurable is you, uh, you there are many resources online that, that can go over measurement for you. Measurable Things what? that you can measure. Let's talk. If you Google measurable, smart objection measurable, there's a lot of resources online that will give you an example of these action words that are measured. Especially if you, it, especially in blooms now, they do that in blooms. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to show you after the, after the break. I want to get this technology up and running. Okay. So, and, and especially in grammar, because we teach, uh, I'm teaching perfect. So we're repeating the same lessons, you know, over and over mm -hmm. each year. Mm -hmm. So when I watch the objectives, uh, they look interesting. Who's that? The students. Okay, because so, they know the content. So, right here with them? How come? Because you just said they get bored. Yes. So, right here with Jack. They're okay. teaching. Huh? You can tweet. Add new stuff. Get you to know your students. They're telling you we're bored. Yeah, yeah. So you can you can write them in a different way. It can still get that same outcome. The I outcome teach can in still a different way. Okay. I teach it in a, in a really different way. But okay. when I start without the objective, they, they activate you know, they do with me, they activate. Without fighting the objective. So I need to change my objective. I'm sorry, but the thing is, if you, if you, if you, for example, this sometimes some teachers tick them off. When they tick them off, they have that sense of like, oh, did something, right. like oh, you know, like that, that sense of like, oh, accomplishment. And so they, what, I'm, what, I, what I'm what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say to you, yeah. is best practices say you should have those objectives on the board, and a part of your greeting is you should say, "Hi, hey, guys, everyone's feeling okay today? Great, great." Today we're going to, and like I said, like you said, some some teachers will even check them, I check them off. off the board. Yeah, you do. Okay, okay. But I, I'm going to beg you to have objectives. And, and if you, know, you, if you, if you find if you find that because it repeats a lot, you just change it. The other, the synonymous words that you can use, you can rephrase them. You still get the same outcome. But every student needs that sense of accomplishment, okay? And to I'm know what they need to know what's successful. I got it at the end of the period. What did we do today? We learned so and so and so. And so you know, we get if, like so let me let me say this. Let, let me end. let me say this. Right at the end. Let, let me say this. It's all a paradigm. You tell someone, you tell someone what you're going to do. Okay. Yeah. You do it. And then you ask them whether do we agree whether it was done. If you don't agree it was done, it wasn't done, we go back, we go back. Go back. If we agree yeah. that it was we done, we move on to the next one. Okay? That's just a basic, basic paradigm. You, you tell people, you go in a court, if you go in a courtroom, right? What happens in a court case? <clears throat> and <clears throat> the Europe, you know, the European version of a court case. You have the opening statement, which the lawyers stand up and say what? The opening statement is what? These are the things that I'm going to prove to you during this case. That's all they're saying. These are the things that I'm going to prove to you, the objectives. And then they do the case, which is what? They, they're presenting the evidence, which is the teaching. And then the closing statement, which is what? These are the things that I covered. These are the things that I proved in this case. Everyone has that same paradigm. There's no different from teaching and learning. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do it. Do you agree? Now, the do, do you agree is at maybe asking the students, do you agree? Uh -huh. or, or some concept checking, accidental questions, the concept check. Or it could be a, another form of a formal assessment. I think you can challenge your students by asking something which is about their level and then start the topic. That will create an interest. Yeah, I mean, because they see that I, they already I, know. I'm more about interest know. during the explanation or during the, the, the work itself. You know what? Uh, Hakka, I'm going to ask them. Hakka, what are you 
I want to communicate what our issue is. What's your question? We know, we know why the objectives of the board, mm -hmm. because it, it's about the context, uh, context yeah, like uh, enlisting the, um, the direct object, mm -hmm. or uh, I, uh, um, what, uh, identifying the, the verb. They know where really what's the verb, so they lose interest with me. But when I start with the activity, start with explanation, and at the end, um, uh, I'll elicit the, the objective that we did. I think I think you have more to hang up than the students probably do. Well, this is what I'll say. Try it. Try it. I think once you, because it's not really a big deal to put it up. You tell the students, this, these are the things that we want to talk about today. Okay? Yeah. Your students are human beings just like everyone else. Yeah. Right? They, need, they need to know it's a uh, yeah, This is not, you're not, you're not spending 20 minutes doing this. This is a 10 second thing. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. yeah. if, you, if, you, if you personalize your instruction, if you contextualize your instruction, they're going to be motivated. Okay, they're going to be motivated. One of the things this what tells your story is that you have preset lesson plans. Yes. Okay. What did I say in the beginning? It's a living document that I wrote. Yes. It's not what's going on. It's not being personalized. For me. So what they're really saying is what guys? Their amygdala is saying. What's in it for me? It's not about the objective. No. It's about, they're really saying, this is boring. Yeah. So it's not, it's not the fact that you're writing objectives on the board. It's the fact that the, what they're doing is just boring. Maybe because it's repetitive. It sounds like it's repetitive. And they're getting tired of doing the same things over and over again. So, living document, personalizing, personalizing, contextualizing, contextualizing. Context, context, context for the student. Okay, so we have measure. Again, you're gonna find that all of these words should be verbs. Identify, write, discuss, discuss, write. Okay. Now, what if I had students will be able to understand the plot, the plot. And Romeo and Juliet. How about that as an objective? Students will be able to understand the plot in Romeo and Juliet. How can I measure? How can I measure? You can't measure what? Understanding. You can't measure understanding. So sometimes you said, I'll see, and I did this when I was a new teacher. Students will be able to know how to. No, okay. You don't know. We don't know what students know. You can't measure no. Okay. So it has to be so stay away from words like understand, no. Can anyone make some another unmeasurable word that we use? Another unmeasurable word that we all can use. Relate. Students need relate to yeah. Relate. Yeah, you can well, actually. Relate is measurable. Oh, relate is you, measurable. If you, if you can measure writing. Yeah. You can be, like ask them a question in writing. Like how can you relate to? Okay. Yeah. So maybe, maybe we'll, when we when we actually because uh, we're gonna write some objectives today, we'll see if anybody writes for us. All right. All right. The A. Anybody know what A is? Attainable. Here. I cheated. I cheated. That's fine. That's good. When you're testing, when you're teaching, you're teaching, right? It's okay. When you're cheating, you're cheating. When you're cheating, you're cheating. I did. When I was in the military, we used to say, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Right? I know we don't want to promote cheating. But you're not cheating, actually. You're actually, what you're doing is what 21st century yes, teaching yes. is, is the student pre-knowing the information. So here's another thing I want to talk about that really quickly when it comes to this 21st century teaching stuff. It really destroys the narcissistic teacher. See, see, the narcissistic teacher wants the students to know nothing. Yeah. I'm going to give you all this knowledge. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I'm going to, you know nothing. You know nothing about this. I'm going to teach you some stuff, 
And then you're going to say thank you because I'm the best teacher in the world. Right? And the reality is that doesn't work. I plus one. We built we should be happy when a student already knows about the content that we're diving into because that allows us to do what? Go deeper. We can dive deeper now. They swim in at seven feet. Now we can go eight, nine, ten feet. So you should be excited. Oh, we can go deeper in this conversation. Alright? So so a lot of teachers they get upset. Oh yeah. Smart kid. He's helping. He's already telling us. So he took my lesson with him. No, we should embrace that. Okay? Attainable. What is it? What, is, what do you think attainable is? Some, sometimes some people will write achievable. What, whether it's, whether the students, whether it's appropriate. Sometimes people write the word appropriate in it too. Whether it's on grade level, whether what you are asking them to do is on the proper grade level, on their abilities, based on their abilities. Now, this is a very important one because we got we have to understand that just because somebody's in the fourth grade doesn't mean they're in the fourth grade. Again, this is the reason why I should be doing learning profiling first. Right? Because you have to know your students. Just because they're in the fourth grade, Oprah, <laughs> doesn't mean they're in the fourth grade. They might be on a third grade level, second grade level. They might be on a seventh grade level, sixth grade level. And you're going to have students who are really on various different levels. So you have to get to know, know them. This is why uh, adaptive assessments are very important. Things like math testing and iReady are extremely important. So teachers give that test, that assessment, first, first day. Give that assessment, not even the first day. You should tell the students to what? Come in in the summertime. Or we do what? We take the assessment that they took at the end of the year. Because they should be taking the assessment at the beginning of the year. The middle and the end. So you take that end assessment, you ask that teacher or you ask the coordinator, give me the assessment for all those students. In the summertime, because you're the nerdy teacher, you're doing what? You're reading those assessments. You're getting to what? You're getting to know your students. From a, you don't know their personality yet, but you know you're getting to know them academically. And you're planning and you're the nerd teacher. In in, in July, while you or if you're on a vacation, you see something, you say, oh, you know what? Ooh, a couple of these students are bringing me time. You know, I think my students are Right? Because you're reading, you're reading their report. And you know something about them and you're planning ahead. So, whether, and again, this is something, this is why some people say, Ray, you hate the textbook. I, it's not that I hate textbooks. Textbooks have their place. They're very valuable to learn. However, textbooks can do this. Text, textbooks can do this. They can be specific. They can give you measurable stuff. They're excellent at these two things. Absolutely excellent. And I would tell you, refer to the textbook for a good example, for a good model. However, they cannot do this. Because they're not in your classroom. Make sense? Shiny. Textbook is not in your classroom. Textbook doesn't know your students at all. The textbook can assume that it's the third grade and that all the kids are on level. All the kids are on the same level. That's the only thing the textbook can assume. The textbook doesn't know what's going on with Monsoor, Sir, etc. They don't, they don't know. Right? So this is when this is when you really engage yourself. And this is when being a professional teacher is, a, is very important. So when the, the parent, God bless them, start telling you, you skip page 24, and you know, and I'll pay for this book. 
And you said, hold on a second. Hold on a second, Tonto. Slow your horses. Stay in your lane, mommy. <laughs> this is the reason. You always get people to why, right? This is the reason why I skipped school. And this is, the, this is the other beauty of teaching the subject over and over again. Is because you can already predict that, okay, I'm going to skip 24. I know parents are going to stop complaining. So I'm going to tell them, listen, I'm skipping 24. And this is the reason why. And they go. And then what happens one, after one or two, they won't question you no more. They won't question you anymore. They say, this is no good. I'm skipping 24 because 75% of my students are above level, 24 is a low level activity for them. I have replaced that with 24 with another activity that I created or that I found that specifically meets the needs of the students in this class. Should they do oh. <laughs> There's somebody called Red Fox. You ever seen, uh, uh, what was it called, the uh, Sanford and Sun? You ever seen that television show? But he used to go, uh, oh, come, he is always act like he's having a heart attack. He's like, I'm coming to join you, honey. Right? Um, but people, people be shocked. Okay, sounds good to me. Because the reality is the parents don't want to be in your business. When they, when they give that school that tuition, they don't want to be in your business. This is one more thing they have to do. That's why they come at you with so much anger, because they'd rather be doing something else. So now I have Go and manage this. Oh, I love this teacher. I don't have to manage it. Show confidence. Right? So attainable is whether your students have the ability to do that task. Okay? Whether they're below or above level. Is it appropriate? Sometimes, again, sometimes you'll see people say achievable here or appropriate. Is it appropriate? Meaning, Third grade, if I'm going to ask third grader to write a five-page essay, am I going to write a third, ask a third grader to write a five-page essay about E equals MC squared? No. Why? It's not It's too difficult. It's not attainable for them, unless, unless you have geniuses in your classroom, right? This is it's just out of, the, it's out of their ability. Again, another, the, the famous cartoon where you have the professor or the teacher asks the, the, uh, the animals to climb the tree. And it's like an elephant, monkey, fish in the bowl. It's the four fish in the bowl. You haven't seen that? You saw that cartoon before? It's a famous cartoon. Yeah. You know, how the, 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 reality, the reality is that fish can never climb that tree. Maybe do evolution. But that fish in that bowl on that day won't be able to climb that tree. So that 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 asking the, the asking the class to climb the tree, okay, yes, it's specific, right? Yes, it's measurable, but it's not attainable for that fish. It's not attainable for the elephant. That's the A. The R. Before you go to um, add uh -huh. on the attainable, uh -huh. you say that are they able to do that? What is the take on the visual sheets? Here's my take. I was talking to someone yesterday about this. Um, my take is that don't talk to me about revision sheets because we over test them. It's a philosophy here that infuriates me. We're asking these young learners, and we're taking instructional time because we're testing them too much. We should we could be taking that time to do to create cultural thing. Testing is not testing is not learning. Okay? Testing has nothing to do with learning. Right? When, when I'm talking about learning, is it a part of the educational process? Yes, it's a part of the educational process. So it has a place in the schoolhouse. However, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with learning. 
And only people who are who have an expectation of directives make it about them. So you hear them say, if you don't do this, if you don't be quiet, I'm gonna give you a clue. We're doing this so we can pass the test. It's what we call teaching, teaching towards the problem. And that's what happens here inside of the lady. And teaching toward the problem, here's the funny thing about it. As a young teacher, I used to always say, what's wrong with teaching the test? Don't, we want them to pass the test, right? Yeah. So teach the test. I used to, and I stood firm on that. Oh, oh, you couldn't get, you could not convince me otherwise. Teach the test. Duh! We used to have something called the Maryland Functional Reading and Writing Test. People say, you know, what teachers would say, who had a lot more experience than me, you know, we can't teach the we can't teach the worst of the test. We can't teach the worst. And I used to go, huh? Of course. And I had this military background. Because in the military, we teach the test. We want them to, we want them to pass. Teach the test. Duh! The problem with teaching the test is what? There's no culture of thinking. It's the culture of it's culture of making everybody feel great about themselves. I taught they didn't know anything before they met me. I taught them some stuff. They got a certain score in the test. I'm a superstar. Yeah, that's what I clap exactly clap for me. Give me an reward. This is success. The reason why we do this is because again, what we're talking about the first day where we met was we don't know what teaching is. We don't know what success looks like from teaching and learning. We just don't know. So we make things up like tests because it makes us it makes us feel good about ourselves. But then people like Bill Bill Gates and Steve Jobs proves that it's all fault. It's all baloney. Jay Z proves that it's baloney. Jay Z was a a criminal, a criminal drug dealer. Didn't he didn't finish high school, and he's going to probably I think he's going to be a billionaire soon. People people are saying he's one of the smartest business people of the, of the century. All right. So, what about your test there? <laughs> See, the, test the, 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 the the reality the reality is tests only make us feel good about us. Yeah. Because we can say because we can say I was successful. We can say that teacher is bad. That teacher is good because of the test. That teacher oh that teacher can keep the students quiet. So they're good teachers. Yeah. That teacher has a lot of noise in it. Why? Because it makes us feel good about ourselves to be able to put people in boxes and measure. Because the reality is we don't really know what learning is. We don't know. We, we just don't know what learning is. We don't know what it looks like. So we create these things called tests and assessments. And you know, in America, we have this big thing where we want to give teachers incentives, performance-based pay, based on what? Test scores. Because it makes us feel good about it. Wow, if I can get the students to pass the test, I can make another ten thousand dollars. That means teachers are going to the test. So it means teachers, which, which means students don't have any deep understanding about that visionary goal. Visionary, they don't have any deep understanding. They have they get surface learning, so they won't be able to what connect and relate ideas and concepts in the future. Which that is what life is about. Because the reason why Jay Z is successful, the reason why Bill Gates is successful, is because they had the uh, the ability to take life experiences and connect them, and that's what learning is. And you have to have a culture of thinking. You have to have a set belief system. See, all, everybody who's successful in life has a belief system. They have a belief system. And people who don't have a belief system are not successful in life. If you don't have a belief system in who you pick as a husband, you're going to have a failed marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
can you elaborate on that? If, you, if, 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 you, if, you, if your belief system is that he has to have a certain amount of money, and da, 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 you gotta be six foot one, you gotta have to fail much. I know, that's awesome. Oh, that's not me. <laughs> because just like, just like teaching the test, what happens after the test? It does not go into the long term memory. It's only in the short term memory for the test, and it wanes away. Again, how much do you remember from university, Oprah? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> maybe five percent. Maybe you had that one dynamic teacher. No, no, I took two tests on me for like what, a, a whole course, and I not, right now I don't really remember much of it. I, and I'm here, and then he's Why? like, because it was about getting through the content. It was about surface, it was about the exam, it was about the midterm, it was about the final, it was about that paper. Not about what the student had true understanding. And I used to sit in front, pay attention, learn, and participate, everything. You, you know what's the best, you know what's the best analog, analogy for this concept? It's the classic. You might know what I'm trying to draw. Yeah. What am I trying to draw? Uh, what do you call it? I'll what is this? The ice uh, ice 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 ah, yeah. oh. See, this is how this is how we teach. We teach for the part that we see. Yeah. But the core part of the iceberg is what? The things we don't see. Yeah. And if you are a captain on a ship, yeah, I don't see the ship. If you're only focusing on the part you see. You only focus on the one part you see. What happens? You're gonna destroy your. You're gonna destroy your ship because what's gonna kill you? Or what's gonna make you sink? And this is why our societies are not being successful because in our education systems, we're only focusing on the things that you see, and the things that are most important are the things that you can't see. And this is why understanding is important. This is why cultural thinking is important. Make sense? Yes. Attainable. Whether the students can do it, whether they have the ability to do it. Are you giving them some type of adaptive assessment? Are you concept checking? Are you getting to know them? Are you uh, reteaching? To make this these, assess these assessments, when you make your, your next lesson plan about whether what you're asking them to do is attainable. And if you're not doing these things, you're going to have classroom management problems. The secret behind classroom management is being an outstanding thinker when it comes to lesson planning, when it comes to how you deliver instruction. Because it's not about the how, it's about, it's about the what. So it's the how, the what, and the why. Right? All these the chairs in a certain the chairs the chairs can be any way you want. They can be on the ceiling. <laughs> you know, you can get people they, again, it's this measurable thing that people talk about. That's why I go and if you notice me in P meetings, I just go absolutely ballistic when I hear people talk about classroom management and well put stand, hit this hit this teacher, you stand next to the student. If you let the student become a leader, they tell you stuff that's actually going to destroy you. If you let the student become a leader, if you give the student an additional responsibility, you're rewarding him for negative behavior. That's not how life works. So what, what do you think happens when, with the other 20-something students in the class? They see, him, they see him just act a fool, and he just got a piece of candy for acting a fool. He just got a chance to be the teacher. Oh, this is, this is what success looks like. You know, this is what success looks I, like. I left and they got another teacher in my, in my position. And uh, it's, I'm in touch with my students. And they're like, you know, she keeps she keeps spoiling Natalie. She keeps spoiling Natalie. I was, I was like, what do you mean? Because Natalie is a very weak student. And so when Natalie doesn't know anything, she comes to her and goes, she goes, can you hear anything? What's going on? And, just, just, and then they're just like, what about us? Right. We got the answer right. So, so, what? What, so what, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is you're promoting Dependency. No, she's just spoiling Natalie. Okay, you're, you're promoting dependency. You're spoiling the children. You're spoiling your learners. Our job is what? You hear me say this all the time. Self-assessment. 
And all this means is students becoming independent. So they could be what? Lifelong learners. And one of them said, I don't want to even participate anymore because what's the point? She's not going to eat this yeah, so anyway. Right. But uh, Mr. Wee, in, in my experience, yes. a child has changed. When I gave him some love and some position, he has changed. After all, he's a six-year-old six child. If yeah, I don't love, give him love, affection, affection and an opportunity. Look, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying kick him out of his class. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying give him a spanking. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm not saying speak negative to him. I'm not mm -hmm. saying don't be nice to him. Mm -hmm. These are the things that this is what I'm not saying. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is don't reward him for negative but behavior. Then the child so here's the how it looks. He acts a fool. Thank you for doing what you're supposed to do. Thank you for doing what you're supposed to do. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Then what he's going to see is. He's not getting rewarded for that behavior. Because all that is is his amygdala going, I want, I want attention. Yeah. Hey, I want attention. And I'm gonna do anything to get that attention. Because here's the problem. Here's the problem. And, I, and again, I'm about to get beat up here because it's, it's ten of y'all that want to meet. But this is women tend to do this. But but this time so, changed. You change you know, no, no, see, you this is, that, see, it changed, it changed, it changed, it changed, it changed in your mind. No, when you the see, child... It, it changed in your mind, okay? It changed in your mind. And I'm going to tell you, there may have been somebody else who said no. No. So you didn't see that somebody else who told you. Right. So you you may be taking responsibility for somebody else's good work. Because I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you, rewarding negative behavior is called enabling. And you can talk to any psychologist in the world, any psychiatrist in the world, and they're gonna tell you you never enable negative behavior. For a six year old. Even for what one of the things my one of you the didn't things, do that with your son, did you? One, one of the things my, my little sister bad. told me, one of the pieces of advice, the one of the pieces of bad. advice that my little I teacher, that my little I sister, that my little sister told me was, because she had a baby before me, she said, Ray, when the baby cries, don't run to the crib. That's different. Yesterday, uh -huh. I did not want to vote your son because... Uh -huh. No, 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 no. See, no, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. No, 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 hold on. I'm not talking about you. Okay. Okay. Can you okay. make it into my show? Oh, no, no, this is... I'm not making... Because you said that to me yesterday. No, 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 that was different. No, 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 that's, that's the point. But here's okay, the thing. Okay. Here's the thing. I saw you going him. I wanted to go <laughs> first. So you could go... You know. Here's the thing. I don't know. You're making it about you. But... Listen, listen, this stuff is research-based. This yeah. is not Ray Rock. It has worked for me. It has you, worked for you me. You are taking, telling me, mm -hmm. you're taking credit for somebody else's work. You're taking credit for your parents' work. Because we know for a fact, you take it, if you want to stop someone from being a drug addict, stop giving them the money for drugs. Yeah. yeah, true. Okay? That doesn't mean you stop loving them. That doesn't mean... You don't care for them. That doesn't mean you kick them in the butt. No, you stop enabling them. Any negative behavior, you just have to stop enabling them. And I'm gonna I'm tell you again, this is where Ray has to put on the king hat for a second. You're probably taking credit for somebody else's good work. And we tend to do that because we think we're the center of the universe. When, the, when that child, that learner has other people in their life, okay? They have other people in their life, like their parents. So you may be taking responsibility for daddy's work or someone else. Because that change, I'm going to tell you, you don't enable negative behavior. Because all you're doing is creating a bigger problem. And don't think about that. Let's say for an instance, let's, take, let's say for one second that you're absolutely right. That what you did absolutely had a positive effect on that student. What about the other 24 students? The the no the way he the way he was acting it became and then, less and then, and then, it became and then, less and then, and then, so what about how what about Maybe he what about the, what about he, he felt the other, I gave him respect Rose make another point what yeah. about the other the other teachers yeah. too. Well, 
No, I am a homeroom teacher, right? So he is with me. That's. I think what she is trying to say is that she's she's stuck between attention and humor. Attention is to give a lot of child attention and maybe somehow this little can be child changes. But if you give a lot to an older child, it is not a child. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to tell yeah, you. It's, it's, called, it's, it's called, this is research based stuff. Ray Roberts, I'll tell you anything that's not, I'm not, this is not Ray Roberts stuff. This is research stuff. It's something called the Gregoric model. You ignore the seal. You don't give them But he's, he's just six years. I don't How can care. I ignore the time? I, listen, let me, that's, you know why? Because, because, you, listen, ladies, take, when you're teaching, take your mommy hat off. Yes. Okay. That's that's mommy shining talk. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to talk to mommy shining. I want to talk to teacher shining. Okay. That's mommy. See, that's, see, see how I bad. See, see how bad. No, no, no uh, Mr. Ray. It it's is early no. I'm talking. Uh, listen, I'm listen, talking about the EQ. Listen. I'm making the child listen, emotional. You, listen, no, no, you're not. You're destroying this EQ. Yeah. No, she's yeah, no, 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 don't defend. Don't defend. I don't need to know. Yeah, you said you're in the wrong room. You were in the wrong room. Listen, listen. listen. <laughs> you're not doing anything for his emotional intelligence either. Because the reality is, he's going to go into a world. Okay. But he blew the world. He's going to go into a world where no one's going to pamper him. Okay, so that's not, that is not the reality of how the world's going to be. See, emotional intelligence Emotional intelligence is about how to deal with the world and how to be a good citizen, how to socialize properly. Okay? The reality is we live in a world of rewards and consequences. Okay? By, by doing that, you're setting the wrong message to not only him, but the rest of the class. I know what you think in your head, but trust me, trust me, it is much more, it's much more valuable, it's much more valuable to do this. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you not talking in class. And then, and then when he is on task, then you go to him and say, thank you for being on task. I really appreciate that. But okay. I'll That's when that. you do it. That's when you do it. That's when you do it. Again, it's called the Gregoric model. Okay, it's it not up. that it's not that it's been done frequently. It was just a start, and then I get this child on task every time. After I make him that uh, that leader for that day, I, he he develops a liking towards me, and he's on task for me every time I I ask him. Let me let me let me. I'm gonna give you one example. We gotta move on because I want to give you a break. A drunk driver. Yeah. A drunk driver will tell you, I had three beers every night. What's the big problem, officer? This is what a drunk driver said. I can handle it. Three beers, I can do it all the time. It takes a, somebody who doesn't wear their seatbelt tells you, I'm just going up. Right? It takes one time to kill somebody. Because you were drinking and driving. It takes one time to get in an accident and you fly through the windshield. And you lay in there with half your brain splatters all over the street. One time. Just because something worked a couple times doesn't mean that it's best practices. Alright? Anything can work a couple times. We see some craziness in Saudi Arabia that works. But when it doesn't work, it's disaster. You understand? When it doesn't work, it's an absolute yes. I want to submit to the fact that maybe what you did for that student worked. I will give you that. But what I'm going to tell you is best practices say that if you tried it with all your students, it's going to be a disaster for you. And it's going to be a disaster for them. But I always felt it decreased my load when I gave a responsibility to a hyper we're, child. Listen, let me explain something to you. Yeah. We're the business, we're researchers. Did you know you guys are researchers? Yes, yes, yes. You're a researcher. Yes. You don't deal with feelings. 
you deal with empirical evidence. Until you do a study, until you do a study where you show me in, in a journal article that doing it your way worked over the course of a certain uh, 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 research group, sample, you give me a good sample, and you prove that to me, I'm going to go with the current research. Group. Because right there, what you're saying is opposing with current research. Okay? So until you do that research, and you show me otherwise, I got to go with the, the evidence right now. All right? All right. Yeah, it's Realistic. <laughs> some, some people will also say uh, relevant. This is, again, this is kind of a, a, a amygdala thing. This is something that they really need. Is it antiquated? Is it relevant to them? I'm gonna. All right, guys. I'm gonna teach you guys how to use a typewriter. They are telling her here in Saudi Arabia, you don't exercise none of any of these lessons we are taking in the ecology. So it's not relevant to those students? Because it's not relevant to them. That's like saying, all right, before the whole women driving thing in the law, that's like saying, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how to drive at five speed. <laughs> so a Saudi woman who doesn't plan on leaving Saudi Arabia. It has no relevance to her. Yeah. Now it does because the law. But five years ago, they had no relevance to her. Yeah. Right? So that's what relevance is. All right? so and the relevance will get you in big trouble because then the amygdala is going to be like, this, has not, this ain't nothing in it for me. And that's the first thing I tell you. <laughs> like, like you're saying. <laughs> yeah. It's not relevant for us. We don't do it this way. This, is not, this goes against Islam. This goes against my belief system. I, we can't use this. You know, that professional development school, relevance, realist, realism, it's a big problem. We have, we had to, we're going to call McGraw Hill in today. We're going to call this Cambridge in. And the guy, you know, he's a doctor and he did all this research and he's talking to you some, about something you cannot implement in your classroom. Nice! Outstanding, cool, but not relevant. So we should change the um, uh, curriculum mapping. Yes. Oh! <laughs> According to the countries. That's the, that's the whole point. Yes. According to the countries. That's the whole point. That's what I was trying. That's what I wanted. I did. A, I didn't do a good job. But that's what I was trying to communicate when I had the dawn teachers here. Yeah. Two, two years ago. That's what I was trying to communicate. Is that once you think, once you have a culture of thinking, and you're thinking about this stuff, then you go, guys, we need to really look at our curriculum. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. But until you have a culture of thinking, they got offended. Of course. <laughs> I swear, there are some teachers like, look, again, we don't like Ray. Look, you should have said it in front of your other TESO people. Look, and listen, why did he say when, it? Listen, oh my when, God. You, when you are not, when you're not in the cultural thinking, when you're, when you're in that sphere of... They're like, they're, 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 they're just like, okay. they got, you know what, they got really offended that he said it in front of you guys. They're like, why are you listen, listen, people not listening? And then you're yes. like, no, we're just fine. If he wants to say it, you should have said it like privately into listen, the... Listen. Listen, 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 <laughs> only the big dogs walk, right? Only the big dogs walk. Last one. Time. That's, this is probably the easiest one to understand. This one is what? Can you do it in a time? Okay, that's, that's, that's an issue I have. Be That's an issue that a lot of teachers have. Now, it's also my issue because because I do what I talk too much. <laughs> so this is my big thing. I got 
Still to this day, I gotta learn how to reduce my teacher time. So I have a I have a formula now that I use for myself that a teacher should attempt to talk no more than one third of the class period. Yes, Mr. Butler, you think that your talk is really valuable. Oh. Yes, if it's not valuable, you so just leave. So in this in this scenario, <laughs> in this scenario, even in this scenario, I probably went too long. Even in this scenario, but we are I tried interested. to. But you, the problem, the, the, the good thing is that you're interested. If I didn't give, I thought you'd get busy, or boring. I would have moved quickly and That's started cool. having started having you engage and do. Okay. But because we're having an active conversation, you guys are talking back and forth with me. This is fine. It's That's called active learning. It's right? called active learning. Okay. This is fine. It's not recommended though. Yeah. Not recommended. I would much rather you guys be out writing objectives right now, but because we're having an exchange, it's good. But I also understand that it's my my downfall too, it's my kryptonite, is that I talk way too much. Why? Because I'm narcissistic. I want to tell the world that I know everything and I got to stop it. I got to shut up. You're rich in your experiences. That's why. So, but, but still, I, Still, that's something I have to work on. I have to learn how to shut up. And in my lesson plans, in my lesson plans, I write in my problem section, teacher must shut up. And sometimes I write, shut up, Ray, shut up, Ray, shut up, Ray. Shut up, Ray. Right? So here, here, uh, here, we're going to go over that, how, this format in a second. After the break. So what about activities? He doesn't want to do activities and they're just like, we're not done! And then I'll just keep so, five minutes. So here, you want to make sure in your lesson that you have the appropriate amount of time to, to, not, to do all of these things. Okay. Yeah. Well, you need to uh, meet, and meet and that's, why, that's why gauging the time, that doesn't, you see, you have five minutes for this, ten minutes for this. Yeah. That doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to be right at ten minutes. All right. But it's just to give you a framework. How much time did it take for you to do this? <laughs> I think we, when we did this last week, I think we were about an hour. I think we were right No, no, no. For and you to write, for you to make this plan. Oh. Actually, to be honest with you, okay. I didn't write this. Dave Clapton's wrote this. Uh, okay. So I can't take credit for that. Okay. Um, but I can tell you, I could do the same thing because I do it all the time. Once I know my lesson, once I know my content, my student, it probably could take me 30 minutes or this. But I already have it in my mind. And I've been thinking about it for days. Okay. That's, the, that's the key. The, only, the reason why it takes me 30 minutes is because I've been thinking about it for a week. And I'm taking the experiences from the other classes. And that's why I say it has to be a living document. You gotta be nerdy about this stuff, guys. All right? Um, so the timeliness is make sure that you are creating a framework for yourself. If you have a 45 minute lesson, a 50 minute lesson, that you are saying, okay, I think it's going to take me about five minutes to do this, about 10 minutes to do this. It gives you a, kind of a framework. Again, you're going to have those teachable moments where you stop, pause for a second, do something else, and that means you lost time. When we get really good at our teaching, Remember, we call this smooth moves, right? We can pause our dance move, do another dance move, and come back to the same dance move again. That's how you know you're getting good at teaching, because you can what we call segue or connect things. Even when something is, is, uh, disrupts this, you find a way to segue or link it or transition it right back to the lesson. Okay, that's that's when you are, that's when you are the Porsche or the Lamborghini. Of teaching, you on Lamborghini status, then, all right. You don't get you don't get flustered by interruptions. Okay? When new, when you start teaching a new subject, you need you don't need interruptions because you, you're trying to figure it out. But as you teach a subject over and over again, interruptions come. You know how to transition right back to the lesson. So timeliness, making sure you have the appropriate amount of time. And here, I, I want to say, and this is why I don't. This is why I get frustrated with myself because you need you need room 
in time and allowance for practice. Yes. Okay. So with that being said, see the transition there? See the transition? With that being said, we're going to take 15 minute break. Then after the 15 minute break, I want you to take another 20 minutes and I want you to uh, I want you to write objectives about just write smart objectives as if this was the lesson. The lesson is <laughs> the lesson is smart objectives. Smart objectives. Freedom is the lesson. Oh, oh, yes. 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 It's really oh, cool. oh, come on. So, all you're doing, that has so many all you're doing is thinking about, just think about some objectives that you would create if you had. Remember, right if this is my, if this is your course. This is a course that you created. You're doing a talk on freedom. What objectives would you have for your clients, for your learners? On this it's talk a very broad freedom. topic. Freedom can yes. be anything. I, I made it broad so you can have the whole world. Because you're going to take this broad topic and make it specific, okay. measurable, attainable. Blah, 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 blah. Ah. Now, <laughs> extra credit is if you, if you can give me a visionary objective, which does not have to be smart, or what Dave calls as a terminal objective. And remember, this is something that you want the learners to be next week, next year, next 30 years. That's an extra credit. All right? So you got 15 minute break, and then 20 minutes, that's 25 minutes. So that means at 11, 20, 15 minutes. Start now? Is that right? 35 minutes. That means at 11, 30, We'll readjourn and discuss your objectives. Now, I want you to place your objectives on the easel paper. Do you know where the pens are? The what? No, this is an individual, individual opportunity. You have easel paper here. You have a ton of pens here. Be prepared to, uh, you can also, uh, well, we'll wait for post. So, you got so 15 gonna, minute break, break, 20 minute. Break for Twenty minutes to work. Practice. Thank you.